All right, chemistry. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to do this lab because when I went through and did the nuclear chemistry notes, I said, eh, Half-Life, not super worried about it. Um, you know, I did fusion and fission. I did the types of uh, transmutation. I did uh, the different types of radiation and uh, different different uh, decay modes. But, um, you know, Half-Life is actually another interesting thing in nuclear chemistry. So I, I, I'm going to use this lab, the Radioactive Pennies lab, uh, as your like, little mini lesson in what Half-Life is. Uh, my understanding is that Mr. Roboto did basically the same lab when you were in ninth grade, I think? Ninth grade. Um, so if it feels familiar, uh, there's a reason. But um, you know, if you want to do this lab, I will explain it. That's why I haven't filled in any of the numbers down there. It's it's page twenty. It's supposed to be page twenty seven and twenty eight. Uh, again, I don't know what's up with the PDF that I have. Uh, don't worry about this acids and bases thing. But it should be page twenty seven and twenty eight. And radioactive pennies. Pennies are not radioactive. Just to be clear, pennies are copper and zinc. They're very stable. Um, but in this case the pennies are representing some kind of radioactive material that will decay at a specific rate, right? So, what uh, you'll need... It, again, if you want to do this lab on your own, I, I think that you are free to. Um, the only problem is getting... Oh, what happened there? Uh, actually getting a hold of a hundred pennies. Like, that feels like... It, it's, it's a dollar's worth of pennies, which is not that much monetarily, but like having a hundred pennies is kind of a hassle, so I don't know if y'all will have that. Um, but what we'll do in class is take a hundred pennies in a container, right? And we're going to say for the sake of argument that all the pennies in the container are radioactive. And I'm going to take the container, I'm just going to shake it around, and then after, I'm going to shake it around for 10 seconds, right? So that's, that's our little time interval here, 10 seconds. So for 10 second intervals, I'm going to shake the pennies around, I'm going to unlid the container and dump them out on the table and I'm going to count how many heads are there because in in our little experiment heads represents a radioactive material and tails represents a stable material so uh, you know I'll separate them into piles I'll count out how many heads remain I'll put the heads back into the container close it up and shake it for another 10 seconds so every time I'm shaking it shake it for 10 seconds dump it out on the table recount right how many heads are there they are still radioactive they go back in the container and so on and so on and so on what uh the end goal is to end up with exactly one penny remaining now again you might end up with zero pennies remaining that's really okay um you can say that it's one you can say that it's zero it won't make a, a ton of difference um theoretically if half-lives work exactly mathematically the way they're supposed to, we would never reach zero. But physically, a radioactive material will always decay completely into a stable material. Um, but anyway, I want to take a look over here, or down down there. I guess I can zoom in. Take a look here at this data table. So our procedure is just like collect 100 pennies, place them in a jar, shake it for 10 seconds. Uh, don't, don't, okay. Something that I would do like people. I, oh, words. Something that I would like you to do. I'm not gonna. I don't want. I don't want this. This part of the table. And the reason I don't want this part of the table is because it is. It has added more confusion than it than it is worth, in my experience. All right. So I actually don't like that part of the table, because we're going to generate our own understanding of half life by making a graph a little later. Now the time in seconds. Uh, this is just going to keep going. 30 seconds. This is elapsed time, which means the total time, right? Each time that you shake the container, you're only doing it for 10 seconds. So this is like, after 10 seconds, this many heads are left. After 20 seconds, this many heads are left. After 30 seconds, this many heads are left. And so on and so on and so on. So, shake, count, repeat. Over and over and over until you have exactly one penny left. Now, a theoretical sample size did this earlier uh, shook this and I had 58 pennies 58 heads 
In order to find the number of tails, you don't have to count. It's just 100 minus the number of heads, because it's 100 pennies total. Uh, after 2, and 27, that is 73. And then we had 12, and that's 88. Uh, and again, I'm just doing this based on I did it earlier. Uh, so I was 30 seconds, so now I have to get to 40 seconds. 40 seconds, and 9 which is 91, and then after 50 seconds, 5, which is 95, after 60 seconds, 2, 98, 70 seconds was 1, and 99, and that's where we will stop. Um, yeah, it, it's infrequent that you have to go past that. Um, some groups, I imagine, might end around 50 seconds or even 60 seconds, but so this is, this is the progression, right? Each time, because it decays, the number of radioactive pennies, the number of heads, um, will go down. The other reason we used coins here is there, there are only two options, radioactive, not radioactive, right? And that's real life true too. For a radioactive sample, the atoms within that sample have two choices. They will remain radioactive or they will become stable. They will no longer be radioactive, right? Now, the analysis for the other, hmm. The analysis for this is dependent very much on creating a graph. Now, uh, the background here is is kind of graphy when I zoom out, but I'm going to do my best, and by that I mean I'm going to use a ruler. I can turn this somehow. I think oh, I think I probably need to use my mouse. No. Oh, it's a scroll, okay. Um, so, I'm gonna make a quick graph. For some reason it didn't occur to me that it was a scroll, but that's okay. All right, so we're gonna make a nice 90 degree angle. We're gonna line that up just there. It occurs to me it doesn't really matter where I line it up because it's just going to draw right on the line anyway. So there it is. Let's get rid of that. All right. Now, the graph that you're going to make, uh, I think it tells you a certain thing in the lab. I'm going to override that. Um, the lab should be number of heads. I don't know why I decided to change the pen size here. I should probably save that one. So number of heads, so how many radioactive things remain, and time is here in the, so 10, 20, 30, oh, those are probably not far enough apart. How far do I need to go? I need to get out to 70 seconds, so in seven little hash marks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably would have been good to keep the ruler out. 10, 20, That's a little big, but that's okay. So we'll say this is 100. This is 20, 30. Okay. So at time zero, I had 100 radioactive pennies. I had 100 heads. At 10 seconds, how many did we have? We had 58. So 80, 60. At 10 seconds, we had not quite 60. At 20 seconds, we had 27. So this is 40, this is 20. 20 seconds, we had not quite 30. At 30 seconds, we had 12. So at 30 seconds, we were just over 10. Right? 40 seconds, so we have 9, 5, 2, and 1. So 40 seconds, I'm just under 10. I have 9. And I have five, two, and one. All right. Now, please don't play connect the dots here. We're going to make a best fit. And a best fit is actually fairly difficult on this drawing pad. Mm, not great. Uh, 
All right. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'm a little under, but I'm going to take it. Um, that was good enough for these purposes. Um, so now I have my graph. I've plotted my points. I've made my best fit. And that is what it says to do here. Now, again, I know it says to do heads on the X and time on the Y. Please just disregard. Um, trust me a little bit here. I, we got this. All right. Now, here are the analysis questions, and here's where I'm going to do my little lesson on half-life. We call it a half-life because it represents the amount of time that it takes for half of the radioactive material to decay. So we call it a half-life because it's how long half of it lives for, right? Half-life. So if I had a hundred things, how, how long did it take to reduce it to half? So I need to figure out how long did it take to have 50? Well, this is why I made the best fit. So what I can do, because I know that 50 is right here, I can go across from 50 and then I can go down from that spot, right? And this right here, this should be the amount of time it takes to reduce the number of radioactive things by 50%, because 50 is 50% 50 of 100. So according to my little graph here, I would say it's eh, probably about 12 seconds, all right? So for me, how much time in seconds did it take? It took about 12 seconds. Now B asks, B asks, how many half-lives is this? Well, that's one half-life because that's the amount of time that it took for exactly 50% for half of the radioactive material to decay. Right? And this is why I had y'all cross out that, that other line because I don't want you to, I don't want that to, to get confusing there. All right. So again, for my data, one half-life is 12 seconds. The reason I bring this up is because question two asks about two half-lives. If one half-life is 12 seconds, that means that two half-lives is 24 seconds. So after 24 seconds, how many radioactive pennies, how many heads were left? Okay. Let's go back to the graph. Let's consult. I need to go to 24 seconds. So after 24 seconds, which is probably about here, let me go up to my best fit line. And then let me go over. OK. So according to my graph, according to my best fit line, which again is a little off, but such is such is life when you are freehanding on a uh, on a non-graph piece of paper. All right. So according to that, I would say that that is 19. Right, it's just off of that 20. So I'm gonna say it's 19. So for me, after two half lives, how many radioactive pennies were left? I had 19 radioactive pennies. About what percentage? Uh, percentage is nice because out of 100, you were out of 100. So the percentage is. 19%. Nice. Number three, how many radioactive half-lives will it take to reduce the radioactivity to about 12%? Right, 12% of 100 is 12. So this question is asking how many half-lives until we get to 12%? All right, so now I'm going to have a third little marker here. So I need to look at 12% is probably about here. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to go over. I'm going to try to make a kind of straight line here. And I'm going to come down from there. So I'd say that's about 32. I said that was about 12, so I think that's about 32. So that's 32 seconds. Now, I might be very tempted to write 32 seconds on this, but 32 seconds is a measurement of time. It's not a measurement of half-life. We said earlier that for me, one half-life equals 12 seconds. So if I need to go from seconds to half-lives, I need to convert by dividing by 12. Right, And the reason I'm doing that, we said that 24 seconds was two half-lives. That means I multiplied both sides by two. 
right? So really, the way that I'm looking at this, right? One half life equals twelve seconds. How many half lives is thirty two seconds? Right? And if you look at this, this is like a fraction. It's a giant equal sign. And to cross multiply, cross multiply 32 equals 12x. 32 divided by 12 equals x. 32 divided by 12. is 2.75. 8, 8 over 12 is 3 over, yep, 2.75. So how many radioactive half-lives? It was 2.75 radioactive half-lives. That's actually pretty close. This curve that we created, that I created here with this data, is actually very close to a real version, to a real um, decay curve in a real, actual, radioactive decay curve. After one half-life, you should have 50% remaining. After two half-lives, there should be 25% remaining. A half-life means that half of it goes away. So after one half-life, it's half gone. After two half-lives, it's half of a half. That's a fourth. After three half-lives, it's half of a half of a half. Well, it's an eighth. In terms of percentages, you have a hundred percent, and then you go through one half-life. And then you're at fifty percent. And then if I go through another half-life, I'd be at twenty-five percent. And then I go through another half-life, and that's twelve and a half percent. Well, if you look, it should be one two, three half-lives to get to 12 and a half percent, to get to 12 percent. And according to my data, it was 2.75, so pretty close. Pretty close considering all we're doing is shaking pennies around. It's a surprisingly good model for how this actually works, right? <coughs> half-lives are weird because it, it just works out this way. If you have a radioactive material, half of it will go away after a certain amount of time. It doesn't matter how much you have. It doesn't matter how much you heat it up or cool it down. It doesn't matter how many pieces you put it into. It doesn't matter if you try to uh, uh, like compress it or expand it. If something is radioactive, it will decay at its half-life rate. No faster, no slower. It's actually really useful because this is how we this is how carbon dating works. Carbon dating works based off of the premise that carbon, radioactive carbon, carbon fourteen decays into nitrogen, which is stable. So we can look at the percentage, how much carbon-14 is present, how much nitrogen-14 is present. What is the ratio? Is it 50-50? Is it 60-40? Is it 35-65, right? What is the ratio? What is the percentage? And based on that, we can tell how many half-lives it's gone through, and then we can tell, because we know the half-life of carbon-14, we can tell how old that object is. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Uh, because half-life is so consistent, but there are, you know, there are still some, some weird things about it. Because number four, can you predict which specific penny in the jar will decay? Uh, no. It's random. This is a random event. I could label every penny, one, two, three, four, five, etc., and so on, but I would never be able to tell you when penny number two is going to decay. I just know it's going to eventually. I couldn't tell you that on the second half-life, uh, pennies 37, 71, 57, and uh, 23 would all decay. I couldn't tell you that. I can just tell you that after two half-lives, you should be left with about... 25% of your radioactive material, right? But it is a random event, it's a 50-50 chance it will remain radioactive or it will become stable. Right. Now, those questions are, are again, just my, my little mini lesson on half-lives. 
Half-life represents how long does it take for half of our radioactive material to decay into something stable. The rest of these questions, these last two questions, talk about uranium-235 with a, a, a many-year half-life and plutonium-239 with also a many-year half-life. And the reason this comes up is because the two bombs at the end of World War II were fueled by uranium-235 and plutonium-239. So why would people still feel the effects of the atomic bomb today, 60 years later? Well, guys, this... This is 24,000 years for a half-life, which means it takes 24,000 years for half of it to go away. Which means if this thing is radioactive, it's going to take 24,000 years before half of it is not radioactive anymore. Which, by the way, means half of it is still radioactive. The other one has 700 million years. Mm -mm. Why do people still feel the effects? It's still radioactive. It has not decayed. We've gone through barely 1% of 1% of 1% of a half-life there, because that's how long this half-life is. This is why people try to shy away from nuclear power and they say, oh, it's dangerous, because the materials involved have these enormous half-lives. However, when harnessed appropriately, it's one of the best sources of energy that we have. But with nuclear power comes nuclear waste. Second question. Nuclear waste dumped in the Hanford Nuclear Depository in Washington is mostly plutonium-239, so it's mostly this stuff here. If government regulations state that 10 half-lives have to go by before it's safe for human exposure, how many years have to go by? Well, this is one half-life is this long. So if I need 10 half-lives and multiply that by 10, that's 241,000 years until we can actually just go in there and do something with it. Which is wild. It's wild. It's not only gonna outlive us, this is, I mean, this is, that's 241,000 years. It's immense. It's like immeasurable. Or at least, you know, to our human brains. Um, but yeah, it's Half-Life Lab. Again, if you're able to do it yourself, if you have, you know, pennies, I I would try it. Try it out. See what your see what your graph ends up looking like. See see what kind of best fit line you get. See, do you have a 50 and then 25 and then 12 and a half? Does it work out like that? Or, you know, is your data a little skewed because it's experimental data? Right? No. This lab should already be up on my CVA. You should be able to check it out. Um, you can fill in the numbers that I used. You can do the uh, graph that I used. Or, again, if you have 100 pennies, or really 100 coins, right? It, it, it really doesn't matter what coins you use as long as they're all coins. And realistically, you don't have to start with 100. You could start with 50. The percentage questions are just easier if you use 100. So, in any case, I will see you soon probably in the next video. Um, there should be a new notes video going up with the last two sets of notes talking about acids and bases and talking about organic chemistry. I'm going to do like bare bones organic chemistry, but acids and bases are interesting, so we'll talk about that for a little bit. All right, until that video, chemistry, take care of yourselves. Um, be good, be safe. All right, see ya.